Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to get another South African on the show shortly to bask in the glory of them winning back-to-back World Cups, former Springbok, and now Leon number eight, Arno Bota, is joining us for a chat about the World Cup, the top 14, everything in between. But first, I think it's all over, Johnny. It is now. You emotional? A little bit. I don't know if that sounds weird to admit, but um, mate, it's been epic. Like ep- same for you. Like seven, eight weeks. It's been absolutely class all around France, all the different host towns, some mega games of rugby, and some magical moments like socialising, catching up with people. It's been great. Um, and when you were in it, it om- like it now feels like it started six months ago. Weirdly, yeah. um, and we've gone through like changes of season. Like we were in peak summer, what it felt like, and what mid to high 30 degrees we're now cold pissing it down back into winter which is a bit depressing but um epic so cool to have been part of it and a little sad it's finished but at the same time what a time we had it was absolutely phenomenal and we'll come on to talking about the final but as a whole because you mentioned starting in the heat and it does sound mental now that we were talking about slippy balls in the grease and the the sweat and then we're talking about slippy balls in the rain but as a whole what is the legacy of this tournament going to be? I guess that's the key. Just enjoying you talking about your slipping balls. That's what I've enjoyed, Tim. <laughs> um, um, what is the legacy going to be? That um, France is a fairly magical rugby country, which is incredibly well supported. You've got to think of all those games between tier two nations, your Uruguays, and it, it didn't matter who was playing. French rugby public pitched up to watch. Um, they've got rugby back, right? So the atmosphere, the tickets sold, the fandom that was here in France was incredible. 18 million TV views for some of the games. Haven't had those numbers since 2007. Um, So French rugby is on a high. And like Top 14 was back as well on the Sunday after the World Cup closed. Every single stadium is sold out. So I think the internal legacy is that French rugby is on a high and it did a really good job of looking after people when they come over here, showing them a good time um, because France loves its rugby. That would be the sort of internal legacy. And it's quite weird externally. I'm not really sure um, because we're here. So I wasn't watching it from afar, but the quality of the games was high. The smaller nations, I think, are now going to be better for it. The gap is closing. I hope with the new competitions that are being introduced that will close even further come Australia in four years' time. Um, so there's lots of little different bits and stories within the big story, which I think was a success. Um, and obviously we'll talk about the final in a minute, but refereeing, the influence that has as well, is that going to change and and flow as we move into different competitions in a new era? I don't know. Um, but, mate, it was, it was exceptional. Very, very cool tournament, and the Frenchies did a decent job of hosting. I think in terms of legacy, it will be different for different countries. But obviously, France, as the host, we know it was a rugby powerhouse already. It's been building. It did a great job, I think it's fair to say, of hosting. But it was already a super popular sport there. The numbers yep. you mentioned are higher than ever. Yep. So aside from the performance on the field, which they came so close, but quarterfinal exit, as a tournament, you know, you've got kids at about the right age. Has it inspired a generation? Mate, the, my boy... My boy, my two boys. So my youngest, Finn, his name is Finn Alistair Beatty. He's in the car yesterday being like, just call me Finn Russell. <laughs> like, and then you've got the eldest, Lockie, who like every time I went to a game, she wants me to bring back a program. And I can remember being the same, like reading through statistics, heights of people, weights, and then just being wrapped up in the games and getting to know the personalities and the characters. And I think that's what it's done. Like the top 14 already had that, but I think even seeing them on my own children, they absolutely loved it. Watching it on TV, getting to see a bit more of the characters, maybe in the social media content that was pushed out in this cycle as well, just learning a bit more about people and players and personalities. Um, yeah, 100%. And the amount of jerseys that have been sold, mate, everything's been sold out. All the World Cup memorabilia, all the French rugby jerseys, they've had to produce more than they've ever produced before. So yes, is the short answer. They've been clearly inspired and touched by the competition and the size and scale of it and gripped. But I think that goes wider than just outside France, right? You've got to hope that the next cycle, 24 teams, there'll be Canada back in. who are going through a bit of a difficult period. There'll be America back in before they host in eight years' time. 
Um, you can have Spain come back in. So, like, that's the opportunity that's been missed for Spain in this World Cup is they were meant to be here. And you saw what Portugal produced. That could have been Spain. So the excitement is how many different countries can you touch? How far can this game grow? And how many people can play the sport that we absolutely love? Um, that's the sort of dream that everyone holds, I think. And Finn's still saying, call me Finny. I thought you were going to say, call me Andre, call me Sia. That. Nah. <laughs> Even though they went out of the group, he's like, no, nah, just call me Finn. He's the only one. He's the only Finn, I think. I don't know there's another Finn in the competition, but I just call me Finn Russell. All right, mate, whatever. We will come on to the final itself very shortly, but am I right in thinking it's holiday time there, Johnny? Is it half term? How's things back home? Uh, hol- holidays with children. Are they holidays, Tim? <laughs> You're in the same boat. Um, mate, they're away. They're, on, they're at a sports camp at the minute. Today's Halloween, so I've come oh, okay. back and... You'd be the same. I'm falling over pumpkins that have been painted and there's more bonbons, as they call them, more sweets kicking around. So it'll be a decent sugar high this afternoon. It's half term here. Um, so I think I'm going to take like the next three days off as well because, mate, during the comp, I reckon I got one week total yeah. at home. So it is now family time. Um, so Halloween tonight, the sugar high and the craziness that and everything that comes with it, which will be absolutely mental. Um, and then hopefully a few days of downtime. But when I say downtime, it ain't downtime, mate. Three young kids. Um, just looking forward to scrapping around the house, some wrestling matches, getting out maybe down the beach and just relaxing. Not being on a plane, not being on a train, not going to a stadium for a couple of weeks and just relaxing. I was going to ask you, is Halloween big in France? Clearly it is, because I didn't remember it being as big as a kid. But as soon as you have kids, it's like, it's fucking everywhere. And the mum's more interested than the kids. Do you, did you not do trick-or-treating as a kid? Yeah, a little bit, but it wasn't this big. It seems massive. It's bigger than Christmas here. Um, I, well, that's the thing, isn't it? It's been commercialised. So now that yeah. it's commercialised and advertised, everyone's like, oh, right, we need to get out and do that. But I can remember being... Fo- I hated it. hated dressing up. <laughs> I remember one year my mum getting, like, a sheet, and she's, like, totally unprepared. This is the difference in mum's now. My mum was like, here's a sheet. Cut two holes in it. She's like, you're a ghost. Right, let's go trick-or-treating. <laughs> and I absolutely hated it, whereas... The kids now, yesterday, we had a Batman, a Spider-Man, and a Captain America ducking around the house getting prepped for Halloween, which is today. So, mate, as soon as you wave some sweets around, and it's not like they're going to go trick-or-treating and do, like, the song and the dance and the quiz that we used to do when we were youngsters. They're just going to go around and ransack people's houses and the neighbors for their <laughs> sweets. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, mate. It'll be good to get out, good to get them out of the house. Um, oh, mate, but it's carnage. It's utter carnage. The same in yours, surely. Oh, definitely. But we have got proper outfits. Is your sheet ready? You cut holes in it? I'm just an escort, mate. I'll just be oh. escorting them around the... That's a different not kind that, of outfit. Not that know? kind of escort, mate. <laughs> the gigolo. Dad, what if you come dressed as? Oh. I'll tell you when you're older. Anyway, from Halloween to the World Cup final, what did you make of it, Johnny? Because people have talked about it in terms of being an epic it was obviously close it was tense there was so much to talk about hmm. but where would you put it in terms of other finals because finals are always tight and tense was this a classic i thought so mate um and i think as well having commentated on something like 25 games during the comp doing the third fourth place playoff the night before so compare it to england hmm. argentina this game was tight it was full of drama there was a big story there were loads of little micro stories within the big one um which made it really intriguing to follow for loads of different reasons and that was just so much drama mate um like the outcome obviously and the big storyline is south africa first time to do it four times um but almost as impressive was the road they had to go to get there you know knocking over all the top teams all those one point wins the tightness of the affairs um it was insane. And then, you know, we we'll talk about the decisions, opportunities missed, refusing to kick for goal. There's all these different things that made it moving to watch. Like uh, somebody there calling the game and commentating on it, mate, you're out your seat. You, you ended up back in the All Blacks to win, even though I'm a neutral because they've got a red card and you want them to be back in the game and then they nearly do it. And like the stories were incredible, but the best players doing it on the biggest stage under extreme pressure and added pressure um, playing out their dreams and trying to become world champions. It's just so gripping. Like that is the sport at this level. So no, mate, I absolutely loved it. Completely different to the third, fourth playoff where it was one-way traffic and an easy game. Um, it was class. You mentioned the tightness. I think I'm right in saying only one of the team, I think England in the 30s, have won three tests in a row by a, by a point. Insane that South Africa did that at a World Cup in the knockout stages, and they just find a way to win. I mean, the red card, 
clearly is a massive talking point. But regardless of that, it just feels like that will to win is is just almost overpowering for South Africa. But a will to win, but you have to unpack how they play. Hmm. So, like, the Kiwis had, what, 60% of the possession in that game. But it was all in their third. So South Africa, long kicking game. Decent set piece, which allowed them to stay in the game, though the line-out was really shaky after the injury to Manambi. Um, but they just say, look, we are so good at defending and comfortable, and we're so fit and so strong and so sure in our systems, have the ball. doesn't matter if you're the All Blacks. It's raining, it's hard, difficult conditions. We'll just kick long up the field, and we will defend. And we will be unshaken in our repeat efforts. We will defend strong, we'll compete on the deck, we'll generate turnovers. Like some of the turnovers generated in that game, like the rips, the work at the deck, um, they were just so impressive. But they are, again, backing themselves with that 7-1 split. Another talking point, everyone's like, this is crazy. And when Ami goes down, you're like, it's game over. But Quagga Smith, the impact, Sneeman, these guys coming off the bench, it unfolded exactly as if they planned it. And every game with them is tight because they're so big, they're so physical, they're so dominant. And their kicking game is so imposing that you have to try and play for deep. And you can. Like, there's not many teams that can run in 60-meter tries, if any, against the Springboks. So they sit to their strengths. They know what they're good at. They're very difficult to break down. Um, that's not to say they're unbeatable. We'll talk about the greatest teams ever. They're one-point wins that if Owen Farrell doesn't mouth back, England win that game. If Jordy Barrett knocks over that kick, and again, we were in the stadium... Pre-game, the wind, the rain was howling. Then during the game, absolutely calm. Jordy Barrett, that penalty is awarded. A hurricane picks up in the stadium, mate. <laughs> You're almost like there's a sorcery. Like, it was unbelievable. So all these little things, if he knocks over that kick, the All Blacks are back in the game and they bring it back to tie and, and who knows what's happened. So it's not to say they're unbeatable, but they just found a way and they had little decisions that went with them in the minutia that meant that they won. But you have to be good enough to put yourself there in the place at the biggest times on the biggest events with the big set piece, with big defense, with an effective kicking game and a trust in how you play. And they have that. And that's what's just so impressive. The fact they've done it again, they've gone back to back and they've done it with what is now, this will be their legacy, the most diverse team in the history of South African rugby. Um, from loads of different cultures within South Africa and you just see how much fun they're having. It's easy to find have fun when you're winning, but I mean, how much fun does it look? The reactions after the game, they're on the back, on the back to Johannesburg, all the images that we're seeing from the boys' social media, I mean, just incredible. And you talk about inspiring a nation. Hmm. See a Khaleesi watching a 1995 World Cup win. Fast forward 20 years, look where he is. What is he doing now? What is that team doing now for the next generation of Springbok kids, South Africans, 50 to 60 million people? And the kids coming through in South Africa, you got to bet your bottom dollar that they are going to churn out some decent kids in the next 15, 20, 25 years. So incredible final for them. We've teed it up perfectly, Johnny. Let's get our guest on now then. And we can have a chat with a former Springbok, a South Africa under 20 captain, who's now leading the charge for Leon in the top 14. Arno Berta joins us. How you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks yourself. We're good. We're good. Well, Johnny's absolutely knackered by the look of him, but we're generally good, aren't we, Johnny? <laughs> we're good, mate. We're just digesting the final. So great to have you on. Obviously, you've played with a bunch of the boys as well. You know them very well. And you must be very, very proud of the result yeah. at the weekend, especially being playing your rugby in France. It yeah. must be great to bounce into training, full of smiles. But how much yeah. did you enjoy? How much did you enjoy that final? No, it was, it was awesome. I mean, you uh it was very, I don't want to say emotional, but just nerve-wracking, you know, the last three games. I mean, I told my wife 10 minutes into the game because we had a, we had a game the next day. You know, there's, the final is a Saturday, and so you, you can't get too hyped up, but you, you don't want to not get hyped up because, like, you want to support the boys. And I just told it 10 minutes into the game, I said, I can't, like, I need something. I can't watch this game for another 17 minutes, like, going on like this. It's going to it's gonna break me. Like, so, yeah, it was uh, it was amazing just to, to see that and, and the emotion of the boys and the hard work, the things they put in for, for each other. It was just, yeah, you know, not not even mentioning what it means for the country, you know, all all those things. It's just it's just amazing to see, and like you say, uh, happening in France, and um, you know, it was like everybody against uh, against South Africa. So <laughs> it was it was good, it was good, uh, it was a good one for me. You mentioned the emotion. We were just chatting about it there, and just <clears throat> literally before we came on to record, watching 
Sia Khaleesi live stream on Instagram arriving at the airport, the scenes, as a non-South African, it's quite difficult to comprehend at all what it means. But as a South African and as a former Springbok, as someone who's captained the under-20 side, try and put into words what it means to the country in terms of what's going on there the rugby landscape as well to be honest like i i um i thought about it a lot like what like how much it feel and i can't i can't get that feeling and i can't get that emotion all of it because it's too big you know the biggest trophy i've won is a curry cup in in south africa and then that is also one of the oldest trophies and that it just that emotions kept on for like weeks so and and that meant a lot for the place you were in and the, the the city you were born in you know in, in the north north you know north of uh, of Pretoria but I mean if you if you just look at all the social media footage of of how people got together and 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 you know after the final whistle whistle went and at the airport how it goes and like see her running out there with the trophy it's just like it gives you goosebumps as you talk about it so I can't even imagine the the how it must feel for each player there um and then obviously for Yes, we are we are rugby supporters, but as rugby players, you understand the game, and you don't, you know, you understand why teams lose, and so your emotion is a bit more in control. But imagine how much it means for a real, real South African supporter. I mean, a guy that will put his flag up up upon his fire, you know, next to his fire, and 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 next to his TV, and you have you have his Springbok here, he's next to his TV. You know, imagine how it feels for that guy. So we have a little bit of that. But you're never going to get the full emotion. As a player, you're not going to get a full emotion until you win the thing. And as a supporter, you, because we're in between. But, um, I mean, I think it means so much for, for the people back home just to get together again. I mean, the previous one was the same. Um, it'll be good if we change some things also, you know. Um, spoke to some of the boys. Yeah, it's like the nice thing for me, it's not, not just because of rugby. You know, it's not just because we won the World Cup because of rugby. But there's not a lot of things maybe that goes for South Africa at the moment. You know, there's a lot of things going on. There's load shedding and electricity problems and water problems in Durban and there's so many things going on so it's just nice to see you know something coming through for the country and yes there is other things also you know there's a lot of positive things place is not bad you know everybody everybody wants to go back but it's good this is a this is something worldly known and it goes for South Africa so for me you know I love to see that and it's also possibly <laughs> This team now is more representative of South Africa than it's ever been. Yeah. More diverse, people from different backgrounds, different schoolings. You see the list of all the different schools everyone went to. Like They're from everywhere, as opposed to four yeah. or five big rugby schools. It's incredible. And the two men that have brought all this together, so you've got Jacques Nienaber and Razi Erasmus. You've played under them. You know them very well. Just how impressive is the job they have done? When you look at the way they play, bringing together all these people, and how dominant they've been throughout this competition with their structures, with their style. Yeah. What are they like as people and how impressed have you been with the job they've done? I, you, you, have to, you, have to give, you have to give them the credit. You know, It's not like take away. You can't take anything away from that. I mean, they just, I think, they think simple about the game. You know, they take the game back to, to simple things and, and they target that, that thing. You know, and I think that's what makes them that special. And then the other side of it, they can bring things out of players that a player can't bring out of himself. You know, it's like the motivational side of it. There's not a lot of coaches that brings motivation out of a player because players play rugby most of the time it's because they love it, they get paid a lot. You know, there's there's a lot of reasons why you play rugby. But I mean, I think he gets that he gets things out of the players, both of them, that that you wouldn't think about. And it's like, yes, I never thought about this. This is good. This is a good another good reason for me to to win the World Cup. This is another good reason for me there today to go out there and just break my body for the team. You know. So I think that is the that is the difference. What he brings, he brings a lot of emotion, but like obviously control and and and, and knowledge. Obviously, it's just un unstoppable knowledge that you can't even think about. But simple things. One of the things pre-tournament that <coughs> made a bit of a, not a storm on social media, but there was a lot of chat about battle stats and the way that they look at the game, maybe slightly differently to other coaches. I'm sure other coaches are always talking about how many involvements you have in a game and and the big moments. But a man who has been brilliant for them for a long time, mainly coming off the bench, is Quaker Smith. Insane yeah. in the final again, turnovers, yeah. stealing ball. Just talk to us as a fellow back rower about the work rate on the guy, how he gets through so much work in a short space of time, the speed, and just how impressed you've been with him. He's like a, like a rubber ball, you know? It's like, there's just no stop. Once you bounce him, it's just going to keep on going, keep on going until 
I don't know what. If something's pushing him, he's going to push back and and he's just going to keep on going. I mean, he's a former sevens player, obviously, so he has a tank. That's the one thing. I and mean, he's very strong. You know, I remember we played a game, I played a game against him and it was a friendly game. And I was at the rock, you know, like just chilling at the rock over the ball. And I felt the brick wall eating me. I'm like, yeah. And I looked up, I thought it was going to be like a prop or something, you know, a tight head or a loose head or something big. And I saw Quacha, I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Didn't expect that, but okay. Um, so yeah, he is, he's obviously, his, his strength and explosiveness counts a lot for him and obviously his fit, you know, and that's as a loose forward, that's just what you want to get to. You just want to get to as many um, in, involvements into the game as you can and, and not just, the thing about him is he doesn't just get into involvements, he gets into things where he makes a difference, you know. When he tackles a guy, he slows down the ball. When he grabs the ball, he's really trying to rip the ball. So it's going to be a long rock after that. He tries to hold you up when he gets hit. When he carries his extra four steps after you tackled him, even though both his legs is in your arms. So he doesn't just get into the to the involvements. He just he does more than that and, and go beyond that. You know, it's the same, it's the same as, as Peter Steff this weekend. It's just something different that no one have ever seen before. Uh, that comes back to, I mean, his reason that's an interview you need to have with him and, and ask him why but like that is just amazing to see that but you also captained the under 20 side that had Ebenezer Beth and Bongi and Bonambi in it was it clear back then that they were always destined to be huge players of the stature that they are now yeah you know, yeah Eben, Eben was um Eben was always a special special player you know you can always see that Bongi Bongi had a I don't want to say Eben didn't have a hard fight Eben when he fought for his way into his he's probably going to play 150 games for South Africa but like you, you could see that there's something special and as a lock, but there was a lot of competition for Bongi. So his patience, you know, he, he needed to be patient, 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 and he was, you know, he, he left the Bulls, went to the Stormers, made a huge success of that. Even when, when he went to the Stormers, there was guys playing ahead of him. So, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of guys that, that can do it. And even in that squad, there's, I mean, Franz Malaro was in that, was it in that also? And this, that's a very good squad. See, I was in there, I mean, um, Johan Gersen was in there, Franz of Venter. You can you can name them. There was just so many, and so many of them became Springboks. Um, pretty we didn't win that, but <laughs> yeah, you can. I'll say you can, as a youngster, you can't really you can't really see when you're 20 years old. This guy's going to play under Kansas South Africa um, because you're also in that race. But but looking back now, you can obviously see that there was something special. I remember playing against Eben Varsity Cup 2011, and it was just you know it was crazy even then. When um when he played, so we played against each other there, and I was playing with Bongi for Tux, and Evan was for, was for I think Aikis. So yeah, it's difficult to say that you could have seen it back then. You could have you know it was special, but there was a lot of players that could have made it. They just the the patience and endurance kept them through it and, and made it made it for them. And you made your Springbok debut around the same time as Sir Kalisi. I think you started in your second cap. Sir came off the bench for you. Yeah, obviously. It, it could have been so different. You were coming through around the, the same time as these kind of guys. So talk to us about your kind of journey and, and how you look back on it. Yeah, it's just, it's rugby. I mean, playing a contact sport is going to be injuries and some of them is going to be worse than others. And obviously, um, never planned for that to happen. It was ACL and seven months after that, I think that, that first one wasn't the problem. It was the second one because 20, 2014, first of February, I did my, my, the same knee again. Um, and I think like after that, you just, I missed, not missed the train, but then things went past and, um, the, the guys just kept on coming through, you know? So it was obviously, if you think back about it now, I don't want to say I wouldn't change it, you know, but the place where I am at the moment, obviously the things that happened in my life formed me as a person today, at the end of the day, you never know what would have happened. You know, even even if you didn't get injured or maybe made the wrong decisions, but I am satisfied and, and a full human being who I am at the moment, you know. Be and, and that's obviously because of all of that, you know, year and a half out of rugby and or maybe almost two years out of rugby and, and informed you and, and built you in different things. So at the, end, at the end of the day, you know, it's like, what did, I, what did I get out of it? Just make sure you don't get any nothing out of it. You need to get something out of it. And I'm sure I did, you know. So for me, that's it's obviously sad and, and, it, and it could have been nice, but it isn't and it's good where it is now, but it's just, it's amazing to see, you know, the guys that, um, that played then is still playing now and how it's going, you know? So for me, it's just awesome to support those boys who, who did make it through. And it's important to say before I say this, it wasn't his fault, but you might not remember this, Arno. Johnny, you were playing in that game, weren't you? When Arno got injured. 
I was. I remember doing my analysis on a young Bota that was going to be playing <laughs> eighth man for the Springboks at the time. Um, or you know, you're playing seven, maybe. Seven, so it's Pierre, yeah. Pierre, Pierre Spies that was playing eight. Yeah. Um, but it was a good, it was a good teammate, eh? and that was yeah, a game good. at Nelspruit. It was still under Heineken Mayer, mm-hmm. but you guys weren't playing good rugby. But I remember you getting injured and getting stretched off. It must have been like the fifth, sixth, seventh minute. Yeah, fourth minute. Um, fourth minute. Yeah. There you go. And then Sia running on to get his first mm-hmm. cap in that game, which we were laughing about in Toulouse. I was working at a game where the Sharks were playing Toulouse and we were talking about his first test and that type of stuff um, during Champions Cup. Um, but yeah, that was a game that I honestly, looking back, thought Scotland were going to win until Jim Hamilton tried to cuddle Eben Etzebeth and got yellow carded. <laughs> we were winning. We were winning until like the 65th minute. And then he got yellow carded. We lost two tries and we lost the game. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you remember these things for different reasons. Different things mm. stick out. I remember your injury. I remember Sia running on. Yeah. I've man, man never seen that game. He was man of the match game. I yeah. remember doing analysis on you. I knew Pierre Spies. Then Sia ran on. I had no idea who Sia was. Yeah. He gets man, man of the match. Yeah, exactly. And Break then, the line from the line out. It's crazy. Simply. Crazy how these things work, yeah. but wonderful experience as well. They're playing test match rugby in Nelspur in South Africa. It was a great tournament as well, but of that course. was come to the end of my rugby career, really internationally. But then you fast forward and I text Arnold last night. I was like, geez, you must have been like 13 years old when you were playing that game because <laughs> you're still killing it now for Leon 20 years later in the top 14. So it's amazing how these things work out. The cycles, yeah. the people that you come across and you play against. Yeah, and how everyone's story is different, but injuries happen and it builds resilience. And then 10 years later in the top 14, killing it with Leon and, and having a great time. Yeah. So yeah, all these different things, weird memories, but yeah, international rugby is amazing. And of course, Sia is joining you in France very shortly. I mean, yeah, judging, Russia. judging by the celebrations and the trophy tour that's planned, he ain't going to be in Paris this weekend when you play wrestling, but he'll be there shortly. What do you think he's going to bring, I suppose, on and off the field to the top 14? It's going to be good, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a, um, a team guy, you know. He, he always brings up the spirit and, you know, he's, a, he's really a team player for the, for the, for the team and, um, you know, a very good, a good guy to be around. It's not really ever a dull moment with him. So, so it's obviously awesome for us to, to get him. And if I was, if I was rushing, I'll give him three weeks off and then, Maybe start him only then, <laughs> because yeah. I mean it's a it's a big deal. We speak about that. Me and uh, Goldman spoke about that this morning. You know, oh Kuni, it's like you 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 only starting your season now. You just won the World Cup and you're starting a season. So I want to say it's a bit of a downer, but like it's you need to give the guy a certain amount of time to just recover from the game and then recover from the off the game and then they can go. It's crazy though. You talk about the emotional investment from watching the World Cup final, right? And how it gets you up and then having to play the next day. But I don't think people back home realize the amount, how draining it is. Like we've seen Greg Aldrich, like Greg's going to take maybe till January off. You got Sam Whitelock who's coming over to play for Poe. He said he needs a minimum month, might take five weeks yeah. before he moves over to Poe. So it is draining. Like the physical effort, Ooh. everyone understands, but the emotional energy... The preseason, this is a big cycle. Everything's gone exactly. into this, and you need some downtime afterwards so that you exactly. can then come and be good, right? Because you don't want to exactly. get off the plane, this massive high, but emotionally and physically be shattered, rock up for your new club in the top 14, which is a big challenge, yeah. and then be poor. So, yeah, mate, it's super important. These guys get a bit of downtime, yeah. rest and recover, and then come revived and then smash it in top 14. So talk to us about the top 14, then, Arno, because this season's a bit strange, obviously, because of the World Cup. So... Has it been weird having three games and then like it's a two month break, isn't it? And then you were back at the weekend. Have you had two preseasons? Please don't yeah, tell a, me you've had two uh, preseasons. No, yeah, not two preseasons. <laughs> we had a four week three season and then we had a eight week one. But oh. <laughs> it's not it's not that bad. I mean, it's uh, it's obviously better to play rugby than to train rugby. So you wanna you wanna get to a place where you start playing again. It's something to look forward to. But for me personally, it's 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 what I do. I signed up to do this. I'm privileged enough to do this, you know. So I always see it as a as an honor to play rugby as long as I can play rugby. So for me, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. You know, the games is going to come. You know, the games is going to end. It's going to be a break again. You're going to start again. So yeah, it's, it, it is what it is. But we are obviously playing three games, resting a bit, and it's a new block now. So we we take this block on, and 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 obviously do our best in, in the next block. So it's a block of 15 games. So that's 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 a that's a nice one. But I mean, you can't moan about an eight week preseason and then moan about 15 weeks of rugby. So there's one thing you need to pick. So excited for the for the next block that's coming up now. 
I just hope the coaches have been smart and that during those preseason there's been lots of team building, if you know what I mean. I hope there's yeah, been a few yeah, beers, we'll some get, social get that, time. We'll get that message through now in the next few weeks also. <laughs> Getting the new boys in, get everyone used to it. I mean, it's the yeah. best bit. And talk about like the game at the weekend. Tell us what happened because you were behind for a fair chunk of the game before roaring back 30 points in the second period. <laughs> and it's a bit of a derby game as well, right? Yeah. Like it's a huge game for you guys. So that's a big result. You know, it is it is a very good result. We had a warm up game against them last weekend, and it didn't go didn't go our way. I think we just uh, we made uh, too many mistakes in the in the first half, and uh, gave them a try from our own twenty two from their own twenty two sorry, and then uh, there are some a few soft moments. And I think it's, it's again the game came down to patience. You know, we were patient in the game. Um, okay, take the three, took the three points, three points. Maybe they showed a few cracks and, and our guys took those cracks and and, and, and uh, scored some tries off that. So, you know, you, as you, you obviously know, how rugby goes, and especially the top 14, you can be... We, we were once 28-7 um, behind the uh, Stade Francais and we drew the game 28 alls. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that can happen, you know. There's games that we played that we scored two tries in the first five minutes and I thought like, okay, this is my first top 14, like easy game, it's going to be... A chill, just cruise through this one, and we won the game by one point. <laughs> so it's never you, you, you always need to be up for it. And I think the guys just reacted on on the messages what we gave them, you know, in in the on the field and and off time, you know, just reacted on that and reacted quite well, obviously. And we went out second half with a better better energy and maybe Clement were a bit, you know, not so energetic that second half. So you don't take anything away from them, but you can't just give yourself all the credit. You know, maybe they there's some slip ups on their side also. So yeah, you know, it was a good was a good game to be involved with. And speaking generally, there's been a lot of change at Leon recently. Obviously, it's a very ambitious club. We saw them win the European Challenge Cup a couple of years ago. They finished third in the regular season last season. I'm sure it was disappointing to lose at home in the the barrage. But generally, it looks like a club on the up. You mentioned before we started recording, you're in a new training facility that maybe it's got a few finishing touches to be added, but it's looking good. Talk to us about the coaching side of things as well. Xavier Garbajosa was there for just a year and then left at the end of last season. What are the players making of it all? Oh, that's I, I don't try to get uh, too much involved into that. You know, it's um, I leave that into the, the hands of the Frenchie so they can decide what they want to do. I'm not gonna, um, you know, I'm I'm a guy from Nelstrom in South Africa, a small town. So I, you know, I brought up with you just you just listen and respect your the elderly and those I don't want to say you work for, but. Those who give you opportunity, you just listen. And so I'm, I'm maybe not the right person to talk to about that because I might swallow a lot of things that some people will, will not take. You know, I, I'm just like, okay, it's fine. Let me do this. Let us do this. See if it works. Give the guys time. Give him his three years. But yeah, that didn't that didn't work out for them and for, for him. And, and maybe some some guys weren't happy. Like I said, I don't, I don't really know what went I mean, on there. I just got the the email like most of the guys did, and and uh, you need to react and adapt to the next to the next coach and. Do you yeah, find out by so, email? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, obviously there's rumors going on in the season, but yeah, I mean, even playing a game against South Francais, the commentators were saying, oh, the players want to get rid of the coach. I'm like, okay, I didn't know that. But anyway, so that's things. It's not like, yeah, it's not really, it's not a funny thing yeah. Like coaches change, chop and change and go on. And maybe it's also a good thing because it's just rugby, you know, it's just, um, they don't take it up that seriously then in their lives if they, if they if they don't get the job, or if they get the job and they get let go of six months in or four months in or a year in, they go and find something else. So it's a good it's maybe a good a good way to see it, but I want to be consistent also. Sometimes it's nice to be the foreigner yeah. and just be be ignorant be ignorant. So to be it's like I, I especially at the start of my career in France, I was like, you just you're out, not out for yourself, but you want to do your bit to perform in the team. You don't think about politics and relationship yeah. stuff that's going on in the background. You just get on with your job. Sometimes it's quite exactly. good to be blinkered yeah, exactly. in this environment. Exactly. But like weirdly, big picture, after having that all going in the background and you not maybe understanding or being part of it, it must have then been quite weird to have that end of season run where you kind of rallied, you got to the quarters into the barrage and you ended up losing to Bordeaux and that was the end of the line for Xavier Garbajosa. I was just wondering this year, so new coaches coming in, goals have been set, like what are the aims and hopes and ambitions for the club? Your new coach as well, Fabian, who's come in, he's come from Grenoble. Like, what's he like? How does he change things up in terms of strategy, game plan? Like, what are the differences that we can expect from this Leon side this year in top 14? Yeah, so obviously <clears throat> the reason for the for any team to play, I'm sure, in the top 14 is to win the top 14. Nobody just competes in it. And as you can see, it goes, you know, it's set now for 
Florishal and Toulouse has been a good few years uh, behind them, but like it, it, it looks to me like this: the top ten in the first five games, any top ten team can win the top forty. You know, it's like it's still it's still rugby, it's still flesh and bone against flesh and bone, and then comes some technical things. Um, I mean, with with, uh, with Fabian at the moment, like he's very technical and that's good. He, he's player invested, you know. He's very very invested into the players. When you know if, how, what the players think about certain things and and um, you know. Uh, technical analysis on players, not just rugby, you know. So that's that's a good thing to see where the players' minds are, and yeah. So it's it's more of that, you know. I'm not going to say it's less rugby because he's very sharp on the rugby side also. So it's uh it's interesting for me, you know. I, I enjoy him as a as a um, as a coach at the moment. Um, so it's it's going to be exciting to 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 work under him for the next hopefully three years for me personally and then obviously I'm sure he will be here for, for a long time so yeah um, it's going to be exciting to see that yeah. I just wanted to ask you about a couple of players because obviously you lost uh, Joshua to us over the bus one of the biggest humans in the world and just insane different to any other player really at the end of last season and you've got in Semi Randrandra so is Semi touched down yet I'm guessing maybe not no he's not here yet I think there's uh, I don't know what's going on there but like, yeah, he's not here yet no I think that he might be, he might be still on leave or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, and just to to over, is he as mad in the flesh as he is from pitch side where Johnny stood, or behind the camera where I'm stood? Those calves, I mean, crazy, right? Yeah, I'm he's sure, really sure like yours him. are impressive, Arno, but no, I've no, never no, seen no, anything no. like him. It's not a level. That's not a level. Um, I wouldn't be able to walk with that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so no, he's a he's he's a very easy guy, you know, to to get along with. He's a very like um soft soft human being. Um, didn't see him too much in the gym because like we don't gym with the backs. Maybe it's sometimes better because we we didn't want to see him lifting more than us. That's probably the case. So no, he's a he's a special player. I, I think like one stage last year he could have been easily the best centre in the world. You know, um, and and I'd say that for uh, respect to all the other players out there, obviously. But I mean, you just can't take it away from you, or just a winger. So, yeah, he's, a, he's an impressive rugby player and a very impressive human being, also. Just just the way he handles himself, um, very quiet guy, and and I like that about him. And and that's why I just wish everything great for him. And you know, going forward, uh, I think he I think he's got a bad injury at the moment. He got against England, but yeah, that's uh, that's bad. But he's a good guy. And the prospects yeah. of Sammy coming in. As well, it must be exciting oh, yeah. too. Of course, of course. I mean, we've I've, I've saw, seen a few of his games. I think he played for Bristol. Bristol. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's exciting to to see a guy like that coming to to your club. It would have been would have been different if we have Josh and him, <laughs> because uh, I mean, I always say Josh can Josh can maybe if there's five games, Josh can probably he can make you win two or three of those games, you know, just by special things that he can bring to the table. There's a few guys in this team that can do the same thing. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's exciting to to get him also in and it's going to be exciting to see how he is. So. Mate, another one to add to that list is David Ninyashvili. Yeah. You know, a guy that yeah. like, burst onto the scene, still young, probably didn't have the World Cup that he wanted, but he shows so much talent in top 14. So you've got guys like Josh, previously creating for him semi this year will be creating for him and then the finishing power and yeah. the pace that he has he's just insane i want to know what's he like as a bloke as well off the field obviously he's got his physical qualities tremendous athlete but as a bloke off the field georgians traditionally are quite gruff direct but he seems like he might be a little bit different what's david like no it's just the same easy guy like doesn't talk too much just uh, he's still very young also so it's it's, it's more impressive for me how he, he acts you know, he doesn't act his age, if I can say it like that. Um, you know, and I you take some twenty year olds, it's just like he just he's just uh I can say uh mature mature twenty one or twenty one, twenty. I think because the things he've achieved already, it, I wouldn't say he knows that, but it, it needs to be in his mind. So that's why he just he's just a confident, he's a confident human being, but very, very uh very humble. So it's probably again why most of the things comes his way because he deserves that. You mentioned Liam Liam Coltman earlier on. Has there been any banter flying back and forth after the World Cup final at the weekend? No, no, no. The cold is so. <laughs> so uh, one of the players was like almost angry that South Africa won. And then <laughs> he was that. Go on, name names. 
He's angry. <laughs> he's angry about like uh, uh, Polo. Polo. He played a prop for. Uh, I think it was at Toulouse. He, uh, he hey, said, Paolo like, Tafili. Yeah, let's talk about the game. And I was like, oh, it's the same game. We're going to think the same thing about the game. And he said, no, 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 no. We're not going to think the same about the game. And I was like, okay, like, what do you want me to say? I'm sorry we won the World Cup. <laughs> 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 That's not my fault. Go and talk to Peter Steff about that. Or Eben. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, not a lot of, it's not a lot of band. I, uh, w. Arnold did lose 200 euros to, to me. So that, that's something I can say. Proud <laughs> oh, sweetens and, it. Even better. That's even and he, better. And he paid me in 20 cents. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. That's, that, good. that's Kiwis for you, eh? Yeah, that's okay. We still have the gold. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, obviously a big win at home this weekend. You're now away this weekend to Racing up in Paris. They had a decent away win against Montpellier last weekend what are you expecting again it's quite fractured a lot of the games were quite broken up and there wasn't too much structure but going up the road to racing 92 what are you expecting from them this weekend what have you seen in your analysis you know, if you just see how they play you know they, they do like to play rugby they like to shift the ball around and run a bit and you can see the nine likes to attack the line so that's just things we look at um and it's, it's not it's not a uh, it's not a secret. I mean, it's it's just the way they do it. So that's something we expect, and we just knew, knew what we need to do to adapt from the way we played and the things we did this weekend to what we're going to do next next weekend. Obviously, again, we need to be grounded for that game. We can't go there and and think uh, you know heads in the clouds. It's something that can that can sometimes happen when you come from a good victory. So for for us, it's just that to stay grounded and and know that um, this is going to be a battle again this weekend. You know, like every single weekend in top fourteen, there's no games that you have like there's no games. To, it's going to cruise by every time. You're going to get a picky on your leg. You're going to get a bump on your shoulder. Or you're going to get a half concussed or something like that. You know, someone's going to hit you blind or clean you from the side, try to rip your head off. So it's the same. It's the same thing physically wise and and, and mentally wise. But strategy is just there's there's a few tweaks and. Tweaks and changes we'll do, and, and maybe just not so much to change our structure, but just to to do things better that we did against them. On Arno, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your insight into all things South Africa, but also the top fourteen. Two pre seasons in the space of a few months sounds <laughs> absolutely mad, but you said it: a block of fifteen games, and I mean, God knows how many more after that as well. Yeah, it's going to be it. epic. <laughs> we'll we'll maybe catch up later in the season when Perfect. the body 100%. body's not quite good. so fresh. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you very much. We'll see how it goes. Thank you. Good luck Cheers, this weekend. Mate. Thanks, appreciate it. Have a good day. Cheers. Interesting that, Johnny. And I didn't know till just before we recorded that you played in that game where Arno got a bad injury in his second cap. It, it could have been different, couldn't it? He was clearly a hell of a prospect and clearly is a hell of a player still, we right. should say, obviously. But he said it there. You only... Some players get more than one shot, but often the bus kind of carries on and it's just timing for him. It's fucking brutal. That's what it is. That, that's the horrible nature of professional rugby. Second cap does his ACL against us for Scotland. I remember Peter Horn, one of the Scottish boys, did his ACL in that game as well in El Sprit. But that's it. It's a year out. Um, and a year out of rugby cruelly is a long time. And that somebody else will come along. Sia Khaleesi came on, was man of the match in that game. Sia Khaleesi's just lifted his second World Cup trophy. So it's cruel, but you have to be philosophical. You can't do everything. And again, it's the different lessons you learn, the resilience, the drive that you get working your way back from the injuries. He, he mentioned he doubled down. He did two cruciates two years back to back. So, I mean, horrific stuff. But to gone from to have gone from having those injuries, which mentally will have been incredibly difficult, to coming back, to performing, playing super rugby, where he was exceptional. But Springbok rugby has a million talented back rowers. And he maybe just missed that little window to go in and cement his place because Pierre Spies left, different people left the country, and that there was a real opportunity to go in and make your mark. Um, but since then, as you mentioned, he's trucking in top 14. That's why I've wanted to get him on. Last year, he was ex excellent as well. He carries extremely well. He jackals well. He's consistent. Um, he's just another outstanding back rower that's been turned up by South Africa. So the top 14 is lucky to have him. If he's not with the spring box, their losses are again great to watch him week in week out in the top 14 and he's superb for for leon yeah really good player and seems like a great bloke as well interesting to see what's going on with leon at the moment we only touched on it briefly with him but he's in a unfinished new training ground but they're an ambitious club and they're going places and that decision to hire fabian gangenbacher from Grenoble, Grenoble. yeah very big call as well because there were links with the likes of michael checker john gibbs 
other big names. It didn't work out with Garbajosa, and they've gone for a kind of under the radar head coach. Brave, because he's young. He's only thirty nine. He's got reputation as a good bloke, but he doesn't have that much top level experience. And managing Grenoble is not the same as managing in Lyon in the top 14. Um, club with huge ambitions with Jan Rubert, their president there, who's a young president as well, even though he's been there for 10 odd years himself. But well funded, uh, good team, like sprinkling of superstars in there, really solid foundation of young French players. Um, so a lot to get excited about, but it'll all come out in the wash, right? He's, he's 39 years old. It's new, it's an adventure. What are their templates, their structures, their detail? What's it all going to be like? Because as we know, like 15 games back to back now, that is a marathon. That is tough going. So how deep is your squad? How can you rotate? Can you nick a couple of wins away from home? And can you get yourself back into the barrage situation that they were in last year? Can you go one step further? And with a new coach, that's going to be really difficult. But the thing that's sort of leveled sometimes at the top 14 is that it's like a revolving door of the same coaches that aren't good. Can I say that? They aren't good. And then because they've got experience, Some of them aren't good. Some of them aren't good, but because they're there and they've got this seven, eight year CV of managing top 14, they get another club and they just move from club to club to club. So actually it's the same people. So I'm excited that it's a new young coach with new ideas, different point of view and adding something different to the competition, which I think is great. Right. We've loved the World Cup, chatted a bit about the final. We've spoken now about the grind of the top 14. We can't wait to get back to the grind. It started again on Sunday. I don't know whether your meter moment of the week is going to come from there. The World Cup, somewhere else, could be just your own Halloween preparations, Johnny. I have no idea, but let's find out now. What is your meter moment of the week? My Halloween preparations. (laughs) No, Um, it's not that. It's definitely not that. No, it's not. Uh, It it could have been. There was a couple of big ones in the top 14. You had Oh, so it could have been your actual Halloween preparations. Not if it's anything that's that's the lowest on the list. My sheet over my head is not getting the meter moment of the week. Um, (laughs) Rassing winning away to Montpellier. That was pretty impressive. Uh, you've got to remember as well, it's still an unsettled time, right? We've just talked mm-hmm. about two pre-seasons. We've had friendly games in the past week during the World Cup. Uh, teams still trying to settle. They don't know each other too well. New coaches were some of them. Loads of players still away at the World Cup. So it was a moment to have a sort of smash and grab. So Racing winning in Montpellier, that is a big result. That also, like Montpellier, have got five points now after four games. That is not cool. Um, they are stuck down there. You've got Perpignan were smashed at home by Poe. That's a big result for Poe as well. But Perpignan, nil point. They've got zero points from four games. Um, the other game that I watched and absolutely loved because it was my old side was Cast winning in La Rochelle, 27-24. La Rochelle going to be without Greg Aldrich, Winnie Antonio, all their big dogs probably for a few more weeks yet. But we can't, mate, we can't overlook the World Cup. Come on. The scenes that we've seen since their triumph back at the airport this morning in Johannesburg, the wave that gives rugby, the wave that gives sport and generally South Africa um, is absolutely incredible. So South Africa winning the World Cup clearly, easily and comfortably the meter moment of the week, probably the past couple of months as well. Hard to argue with that. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. Recently making over 20 million cooks better, the game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. And you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FrenchPod10 at checkout. That's FrenchPod10, and you'll get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Touched on a lot of the top 14 there, Johnny. Yep. La Rochelle, you mentioned missing players, but that's still a surprise, isn't it? I guess, even though cast aren't really missing many. Um not really, mate. I mean, I mean, I, I know there's there's Jack Nowell and uh, Dylan Leds, and they've still got talented boys there, but this game is still based on physical dominance, right? It doesn't matter if you're at the World Cup or if you're on top 14. When you remove Will Skelton, Winnie Antonio, Greg Aldrich, Buddha Hunt. Jonathan Dante, like you're moving all of the game makers and grinders that give La Rochelle gain light, right? Um, and cast aren't missing anyone. They had Santi Arata back. Um, they've got all of their players available. So, I mean, maybe for me, I mean, to outside, yes, that's a surprising result. La Rochelle don't lose at home. They have 80 odd sellouts on the trot, but I kind of saw that coming. 
I don't know. I don't know. I watched the game as well, so I saw how it unfolded. And Cast were there, present, physical, scored some decent tries, took their opportunities. Um, and La Rochelle kind of got the heart of their team not there. So maybe from the outside, you would never see that happening. But I kind of had a feeling before that it was going to be very, very tight and, and cast my old side very worthy winners. And wrestling with the other big away winners at Montpellier, you touched on that as well. Are they two teams heading in the opposite direction? We know the infrastructure, everything is there at wrestling. We've spoken quite a bit about Stuart Lancaster coming in and the job that he is hopefully yep. going to do with them. Are there signs that he's doing it already? Shoot. Um, like I still think they've got some recruitment possibly to do, but Montpellier is a different one. They're at the end of a cycle. So they've won their top 14. Philippe Saint-André, who I caught up with in Paris, is leaving at the end of the year. They're going to have different people come into their structures. So it's also a wee bit unsettling. Um, so I don't know. The, the potential that may be a little bit unsettled, still waiting for some of their players to come back. Rassing, Stu Lancaster's there, start of a contract. He's got his fingerprints all over the way they're playing. Quick rugby, ball in hand, challenging big size in the top 14. So I don't want to be too negative about Montpellier because still got a lot of mates there. They've still got a lot of talent there as well, but it just looked a bit clunky from them. And again, to lose one at the weekend, they beat Bordeaux 29-22, but their performance was very clunky, like missing all of their front line players. It just didn't quite click um, and for them they still managed to win but Montpellier not quite clicking a racing side has arrived and knocked them over it's only a three point win but they've still lost at home which is a, a, you know, a big loss to take at this stage of the season and it might be important come the end so racing yep on the up young youthful um, have struggled but potentially with Lancaster there is that the type of speed running rugby that we're going to see or as the game wears on as the game gets wet over the next two three months 15 games on the trot are they going to be ground down by their lack of size which is what's been leveled at them lack of size and lack of power compared to previous years Toulon hammered Oina no surprise there really yep. given where those two clubs are at should we start the rumor mill already the transfer gossip column I mean it never stops in France does it I know they're in France already for the World Cup but two England players Carl Sinclair and Lewis Ludlam allegedly spotted in Toulon Johnny anything in it you reckon well, I I don't know, mate. You got to think as well the financial situation of the Prem. Um, they've still got to balance their books. There are salary caps to be juggled. Um, it's not easy, mate, in the Prem. So I think you'll probably see over the next six to twelve months a few more guys come over. Carl Sinclair, a potential Lewis Ludlam as well. I'd be more surprised if Ludlam's to come over. Yeah. Um, but a tight head prop, Carl Sinclair, big CV. Um, you could understand the move. Um, it's been interesting as well the clubs that have folded guys like Henry Arundel will still be eligible for the English setup they can still play in the Six Nations even though he didn't get too much game time during the World Cup but for a guy like Cal Sinclair is that the end of the road in the Prem um, as he given up in England he kind of lost his starting spot to Dan Cole during the competition is that then a sign that he's going to move over anyway it's been in the press over here haven't seen many others though but he could be a very decent and handy signing for too long There'll be plenty more in the weeks to come. We know that for sure. Top 14 again this weekend, second of 15 blocks in a row, whatever Asano was telling us. What are the biggest games, Johnny? What are you looking forward to? Um, I'm actually looking forward to Racing Leon. It was nice to have Arno on, um, but that's another one. Like I really enjoy games at the arena just yeah. because you're guaranteed 22 degrees, dry ball, running rugby, and some action. Uh, Perpignan playing at home to Toulon, that's massive um, for Perpignan already. We touched on how many points they do not have already. They've got a decent track record against Toulon. Um, they're in the south. Oyonnax against La Rochelle. La Rochelle again wanting to do something or rebel after that loss to Casp. Oyonnax oh, oh, desperate for points. But this is the weird thing. Like Every single clash is going to be epic. Bordeaux against Montpellier is another one. Uh, Yannick Brew, I'm not sure how many players he'll have back or when Damian Peno and Yai Barry, these guys are going to be back for Bordeaux, but they're going to be fully loaded, hopefully, uh, and looking to gun down Montpellier. And then you've got Stade Francais cast, which will be very funny to watch Rory Cockott if he's starting playing against his cast teammates. Yeah. That's always going to be good fun. Uh, and Clermont Bayonne. So, mate, it continues. This is round two of 15 of consecutive games and Top 14 rugby, we're very lucky to be here at the start. You can officially say now probably the top 14 season has started. 
Uh, and yeah, so huge crunches this weekend. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Arno Berta for joining us. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Forget your fancy World Cup stuff. Back to the grind, just how we like it. Loads of top 14 coming up. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review too if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass as well as on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. See you then, mate. Bye.